Canadians join American forces in the campaign to drive the Japanese out of Kiska, last enemy base in the Western Hemisphere. Canadian and American generals with Admiral Kincaid, Allied commander, supervise the embarkation somewhere in the Aleutians. In the gray Arctic light, the combined Allied fleet steams for its objective. Troops don war paint, camouflage, for what they expected to be the bloodiest of battles against a foe fighting to the death. The strategic importance of Kiska, 2,850 miles by air from Seattle, 1,100 miles to the great Jap base at Paramushiro, Kiska to Tokyo, 2,000 miles. Landing forces roll ashore armed to the teeth. For 14 months, the enemy has occupied the island as a base. Now, Allied forces move in to reclaim the American soil of Kiska. And the landing is unopposed. The Japs, who never retreat, have fled. Bombed repeatedly from the air, the Japs were forced to live underground. Kiska, again in American hands, is a new stepping stone to Tokyo. Like a page torn from the history of ancient China is this scene of laborers toiling with primitive tools. But today, people of the new China are building aerodromes from which fighting planes are repelling the Japanese invader. Working almost entirely without modern equipment, they are carving miracles out of the wilderness. With no cement available, they use rocks broken by hand. Cracked granite mixed with mud. With no steamroller to flatten the landing strip, 300 men haul a heavy roller across the terrain. The mass power and courage of China's millions is proving more than a match for the Japanese. Already from aerodromes like this, China is striking back. British anti-aircraftsmen in the United States to exchange ideas on aerial defense get a rousing reception as they parade up Broadway to New York City Hall. <laughs> Veterans of London, Malta, and North Africa, they've downed many a Nazi plane. Now they're welcomed as heroes by New York's Mayor LaGuardia. Churchill, pretty 20-year-old daughter of Britain's Prime Minister, herself a subaltern in the Territorial Service, visits a camp of America's Women's Army Corps. At a seaside post, she inspects a lifeguard unit and sees a demonstration of life-saving. As democratic as her father, Mary Churchill is popular with her American sisters in arms. Speeding the machines of war, trucks, motors, tanks, from supply depots inland to ship convoys waiting at seaports, is the war job of America's vast network of 45 great railway systems. Moving an infantry division with full armored equipment requires 65 complete trains, more than 1,350 flat cars and coaches. Army engineers, skilled in the complex problems of supply, supervise the loading. Not a moment is lost, not a square foot of space is wasted.
equipment loaded and lashed down for the trip, troops go aboard. In this way, millions of men of the armed forces were carried by American railways in the first 10 months of the war. From traffic control towers, railway dispatchers operate fleets of troop and passenger trains over a half million miles of track. On every line, troop trains have the right of way. Speed is the watchword. Passenger flyers are sidetracked for the less spectacular freight. Freights with their cargoes for the fighting fronts must go through. Army cooks set up their commissary departments en route. There's no stopping as fresh troops and supplies are sped across the continent day and night. At embarkation ports, ship captains await the arrival of their war cargoes. And dawn finds the railways delivering the goods on schedule time. Week after week, these veterans of the throttle are rushing more and more troops to swell the rising tide of armed forces being sent overseas. The convoys may sail on schedule. American railways are playing an important part in helping the United Nations win the war. At an air depot somewhere in Australia, Supplies from overseas are unloaded in vast quantities as General MacArthur marshals his forces for new drives against the Japanese. Powerful concentrations of material and equipment which already have delivered smashing blows on New Georgia and New Guinea. Allied bombers, liberators and flying forts roaring across the South Pacific. Over Salamawa, the big Jap base on New Guinea, Shore positions are pounded from the skies. Down in that bomb-blasted jungle, Japanese columns are being encircled by Australian and American troops. The bombing of Leh and Salamawa by the Allied forces. 